if he's a good boy, next time he's over, we're going to bring him down there, and show it to him. Oh, we're going to kick off everybody in just a couple of minutes. We'll give people uh, a chance to come in. So bear with us. You can still chat, chat, chat. It's okay. You don't have to be quiet now. <laughs> we need to get an ominous mu music, Michelle, you know? Like, oh. Like Jaws or something. Yes, we, we had actually planned um, you to play the ukulele. Um, you didn't get that memo, no? Ooh, I can nearly play two chords consecutively now. I do know of a musician on this call. He was actually a professional. Uh, there are, there's, a, there's a professional disc jockey on this as well. There is. In a previous you. life. Indeed. He's not taking the bait, so I think he should. No. Be. He's kind of keeping very quiet there. He's staying on mute. Uh, so people are just coming in. So we will kick off very shortly. Okay. Give you a chance to enter. Are they real birds or added in birds that you have in the background, Michelle? Really, can you hear the birds? <laughs> they are uh, specially recorded uh, for atmosphere, um, but also there's just a few crows outside, yeah. Okay, so can we expect to have the dog this time as well, or is this no. The dog has decided to cut its performing career short which I know is to the disappointment. Oh no, loads of people are leaving now. I just, sorry people, if you came to see the dog, <laughs> dog's not here. We, Julie has a dog, we, we could replace my dog. <laughs> okay, so I think we shall kick off We've got lots of people in so welcome everybody i will not be on here for very long but welcome to the final webinar of the year um if you can't do without us after this webinar uh over the christmas period we do have uh the podcast available bits bites and banter so you can tune in there at your leisure and um, just to kind of give you an overview of today, um, this is over 60 minutes, the webinar. At the end, we'll have about 15 or 20 minutes uh, of Q&A. So you will have a chance to ask the questions that you want to. Have a look for the, the Q&A icon on Zoom and you'll be able to put your questions in there. If you see any questions that you want to be asked, you don't have to type in your question again. You can actually upvote existing questions and that will help uh, Julie, our moderator as well, to um, pick through the the questions that are coming in. Um, in a year like no other, I think this is a brilliant topic to be looking at. It's global data and the way we live, work and play and how it's changed. Um, we're broadcasting across multiple time zones. Uh, we have speakers and listeners from the US, the APAC region and Europe, of course, as well. So you're also welcome here today. We have Buddy Riser, Executive Director of Economic Development, Development for Loudoun County, Virginia, and little known fact, curator of over 10,000 vinyl records, which we found out earlier today. Uh, we've got Omar Wilson, Head of Marketing, APAC Digital Realty, who little known fact was my successor in digital realty. And then we have our very own uh, Gary Connolly, founder and president of House in Ireland, whose little known fact can't be repeated in front of an audience. And then last but certainly not least, we have our moderator, Dr. Julie Albright, a PhD in sociology. And quite frankly, such an impressive uh, list of accolades I ran out of paper when I tried to write them all down. She's the author of Left to Their Own Devices, 
how digital natives are reshaping the American dream. And it looks at how we live, our societal norms, how they're changing fundamentally and the impact that'll have on our society, both in positive ways and also the potential threats around that as well. So based on her credentials, there is no better person to moderate this rowdy bunch. So over to you, Julie. Oh, thank you so much. And thanks to Host in Ireland for assembling this amazing panel. I can't wait to hear from everyone today. Well, I thought I would just frame up the day with a few comments. I've been thinking about the intersection of digital technologies and of society for, for my whole career as a sociologist. Uh, by the way, I also have a dual doctorate. I have two masters and a dual doctorate. The other side of it is in counseling. So you're gonna hear about behavioral issues going on. So just so you know, I have a kind of a depth of, of understanding in that area. So what I do, I look at patterns. I like to see, say I see the constellations in the stars. And one pattern that I sort of discerned or came up with is an analytical framework for understanding what's going on. And that is I use the double helix of DNA, which I'm sure you've seen where technology and behavior are intertwined. Technology drives behavior and behavior drives technology. And it's a way for us to understand that these two things are now deeply embedded with one another. I don't think they'll ever be sort of torn asunder again, that these things are the socio-technical DNA of society now driving all these other behaviors and driving new technological development. So that, that's really the central idea to think about today. Now, for the last few years, I've been thinking about uh, some ideas around how to understand the changes, not only in the United States, but around the globe that's going on driven by this double helix. And I started again, as I said, I like to see patterns. And I started looking at research from a variety of fields, from neuropsychiatry to business, to communications and counseling and psychology to sociology, a wide plethora of studies. And I started noticing that they all can fall under an umbrella idea. This idea I call coming untethered. And it's this notion that uh, young people in particular, I'm talking about millennials and younger, but I started looking at millennials with this first set of studies, they are coming unhooked from traditional ways of doing things, traditional processes, careers, social structures, things like family, getting married, church, uh, belonging to political parties, all these kinds of things that were routine behaviors for prior generations, young people are unhooking from these things in droves. Uh, and that, and at the same time, the other side of that is they're hyper attached to digital technologies. When I first came to USC, I told them, uh, they were saying, oh, you know, you can look at new ideas. We're all about new ideas. I thought this is fantastic. And so I ran up to the guy after the welcome PhD student speech. I said, I wanna look at the impact of computing on society. The guy looked at me, he said, what does that have to do with sociology? I said, oh my gosh. <laughs> so, I mean, they had no idea what I was talking about, period. And, and I knew that this was gonna be one of the biggest drivers of social behavior of all time. And arguably you could say it's probably the biggest driver, the printing press, the industrial revolution, the digital revolution. And here we are, not only are we in it, but you guys are really the, the beating heart of it and the, and the blood of it. So uh, really looking forward to your thoughts on, on these ideas. So we've got a generation. And the reason I looked at millennials was that they grew up in a world where there always was an internet. Some of you uh, may have come to the internet uh, later. We call those digital immigrants but the younger group of millennials are digital natives. But I think what's interesting, and we, we maybe we won't go into such depth about this right now, but just for your thinking, younger generations than the millennials grew up in a world where there always was mobility, smart devices like the smartphone, like the iPads and things like that. And even younger, 
are now growing up in a world, not only where they're getting those devices in their cribs and bassinets and prams, for those of you in the UK, uh, they are also growing up in a world peopled by digital agents, that's the series, the Alexas, and, and, and to come. So this idea that they're going to be growing up in a world where they routinely interact with non-human beings as a, just a normal part of the day. A friend of mine did an early write-up on a video conferencing thing that some of you may remember. It was very breakthrough called See You, See Me. Do you ever remember seeing that? It was one of the first Zooms in a sense. You could see the face and talk to somebody. And he talked to his young son who's now in college about it and said, oh, I wrote this story about See You, See Me. And the son looked at him and goes, what's the big deal? I can go on the internet now at any time and see a face and see people and chat. Like, what's so revolutionary about that? So this idea that it's just become normal. It's like the fish in water, that the digital is so intertwined in their lives. What's the big deal? This is normal life. So this is driving, and I'm just going to hit a few highlights real quick. Uh, this is driving changes in behavior and changes in values. And I'll just, I'll just knock through a couple of those and then we'll finally uh, wrap up with COVID. One, the young people want a digital interface. They're more comfortable texting than talking face to face. And in fact, a recent study said that young people are more likely to talk to their best friend by texting than they are face to face. They're not necessarily as comfortable talking on the phone, making a phone call. When the iPhone first came out, 95% of the time, it was used for phone calls and 5%, 10% of the time for, app, for apps. Now it's reversed. So only 10% of the time now is it used for phone calls and the rest of the time is used for apps, texting and all that. So we've seen a real shift there. And as I said, there's an unmooring happening from social institutions. Young people around the world aren't getting married aren't buying a home, aren't having kids at anywhere near the rates of older generations. Just as a, as a, a number, so you can kind of get your head around this. If you look in the, in the US at the silent generation, they're now in their 70s kind of thing. They went through World War II, all that. By the time they were 32 years old, 65% of them had married. Now with millennials, by the time they're 32 years old, only 26% of them have married. Why is this important to you as managers, as owners, as businesses, as, as running employees? Because that uproots them from having to be in one place forever. And so that combined with the platform economy that's emerged, the Ubers, the task rabbits, the Fivers, it's decoupled place of work and work. So people now can work from anywhere. And there's a big trend to want to work from home. And in fact, not only that, young people think they have a right to work remotely. And that's a big shift compared to let's say baby boomers um, that came before them. Seven out of 10 say, why do I need to be in an office anymore at all? I can work from Starbucks, I can work from home, I can work from Bali by the pool. Another trend linked to that is hashtag van life. That you know, why not live in a van, trick out a van and drive around and have an adventurous life or backpack around Europe or go to the Southeast Asia and, and, and live and have, a, have an adventurous life. So all these trends had started, and this is what I explored in my book, and even to the point of looking at digital currencies like Bitcoin as an untethered economy, as this untethered workforce blossomed. Well, here we are now. Part two of the biggest drivers of social change, we're now in the midst, as you know, of a global pandemic. And what that's done, it's served to accelerate these trends that I've been looking at. So now we're not just talking about leading edge millennials, we're now talking about this is quickly mainstreaming to everybody. We're all now working from home. We're all now doing these same sorts of things. So. We, I've been running a, a salon since the beginning of this thing called The Great Reset. And through this, have thought through the changes that are going on, again, technology and behavior, and now in this new context of a global pandemic.
five of those. Number one, there's a huge flight from the cities going on or what I call dispersion happening. And this is happening in the US, this is happening in Europe and other places. We found in the midst of a pandemic that density is not your friend. So that's number one. Second is more work from home, which I already mentioned, untethered workforce is, is, is going not only temporary, but these are the trends that are gonna last beyond the COVID moment. So these are gonna be ingrained in the new workforce, if you will. Third, because of this, we have realized that bodies are risky. So we see an increase in touchless and an increase in automation, digital employees. There's been a 300% increase at IPSoft inquiring about Amelia that can take on digital HR, digital jobs. So we can remove the bodies from the workforce. There's an automation in food processing, food service, food delivery, all sorts of areas of automation, which again, plays back into what you're doing. Number four, because of the social unrest and, and also this decoupling of place and work, there's an increased desire for security and surveillance happening. And fifth, we already had a foot among young people, some stressors, an increase in things like as they decouple or unhook or what I call untether from these social institutions that are longstanding, guess what? It turns out that's what was keeping people moored and physically and mentally healthy and happy. As people unhook and nothing really takes the place of it, Instagram does not take the place of these kinds of institutions that we have a boom in the college age and above young people in anxiety, depression, mental disorders, and that's being amplified under COVID loneliness and things as we're further isolated away from people during these shelter in place moments. So those are the five trends. Uh, we see, again, a huge drive of these things of coming untethered uh, because of COVID, the increase and acceleration of this double helix of behavior and technology driving one another under COVID. And I mean, frankly, it's been fascinating. This is the biggest social experiment ever known to man uh, that we could never have done as social scientists, but here we are. And I can kind of sit back and observe and make sense of it and help you guys to kind of see where we're going in the future. So that's enough for me, uh, I'm sure for now. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and have you guys, if you wouldn't mind, talk about what is top of mind for you when do you think about this change in living, working, playing, and global data in 2020? Gary, I'd like to kick it off with you if you wouldn't mind. Let's hear your top of mind thoughts on that. Well, the, the first thing I was fascinated by nearly every single word you said there, because I have an 11 year old living with me. So I have my own research and development department inside. And we're getting to the stage now at 11 where questions are being asked about stuff, yeah? And usually when a child of that age and asks, Dad, I want to ask you a question, it's a, I hope your mom's around to answer it moment, but it's not quite that bad. She asked me recently, she said, Dad, I have a question. Could you tell me what's your view on unconscious bias? <laughs> You know, you go, oh, my goodness, what? It's a moment for, well, what's your view? Because, but she had learned in school that there was algorithms that were in the main being developed by male, bald men. Well, not quite the bald bit, but you get the gist. So basically, they are already mindful that the, the, the bias on algorithms that are in all the platforms you mentioned, are there to stimulate dopamine in the brain and other chemicals. And therefore, the fact they're mindful of it and aware of it allows them to then be prepared for it slightly. So when I think of this year, though, and, and, and again, you, you finished off with the COVID and the greatest social experiment of all time, I think we should uh, also, just for a moment, give thanks because it's, it's been a bad year. Write that down. It's been a drastic year, a terrible year. But there have been some marvellous front lines that have helped us get through this, from the emergency services to the scientific front line. And then we come to the digital front line. 
And I know you've painted sort of a good, bad and not so great future on it. But however, the tools that were available to us over this year and the ability that we had to call on that digital front line has helped us have any form of a norm, which when we consider there might be some outages today in a few of the platforms, but I'm not sure, Julie, what the norm would have looked like if we hadn't have had Zoom, if we hadn't had Meets, if we hadn't had Netflix, or if we hadn't been able to order lots of beer and wine from the local store with a click and collect. So I, I, I think what digital to me has always been are tools. And again, we have to teach people how to appreciate and use those tools in the same way as my father was, was a mechanic. And to his own admission, he was a really bad mechanic. And no amount of great spanners made him a better mechanic. But he always cleaned the car after he fixed it and spoke to the person and therefore, they always said, he's a lovely fella and a great mechanic. And he knew he was a terrible mechanic. So these are tools of the modern era. You know, we shouldn't be fearful of them. And I certainly believe, to, to finish, words matter right now, more than ever. Words matter. And as people that are on this call and maybe uh, uh, talking also, talking about things like digital humans and stuff, it scares most of the people that we're trying to bring along. So we should say we're humans with all the biological highs and lows of humans, but we've got a whole arsenal of tools that we can use. That's the language that I think is important. So what I've seen is the acceleration of the digital uh, evolution, not transformation. Because for a lot of industries, we have just seen an acceleration um, which has been an evolution as distinct to a transformation. So, um, yes, data, as you said earlier, is the, is the ink on the printing press of the 1400s and is the steam of the Industrial Revolution one, and is data is now the equivalent steam of the Industrial Revolution four. But it has definitely accelerated our dependency um, good and not so good on data. I love that, Gary. Well, you know, uh, I think you might find it interesting. A, a fellow on a call recently said that uh, he, he calls us PPTs, personal protective technology, and gave the example of nurses using iPads to monitor COVID patients at a distance and it helps keep them protected. So it's like, God bless all the technologists for that kind of thing. So, you know, really wonderful. Thank you so much. Oh man, let's, let's hear from you. What's top of mind for you when you think about uh, how we're in this changing moment of living, work and playing and, and global data in, in 2020? Thanks, Julie. I think I'd, I'd agree with, with, as Gary said, everything, literally everything said um, from, from the start. I think again, to start with your point uh, early on, Julie, it's, it's, you know, it's hard not to iterate the, uniqueness of the time we're living in. I think uh, just the other day, Prince Harry made a great, great quote, I thought, where he said, it feels like mother nature has sent us all to our rooms uh, because we've been bad, bad little, bad little children, which I thought was incredible because <laughs> literally really the, world, the world has been sent to their rooms. And as Gary said, um, if we think about this happening pre 2000, uh, it would be quite interesting to see how people would have communicated. Now, Gary, Gary mentioned a few tools there, but then you could go to, you know, WhatsApp and the, the communication tools being used, whatever they may be. People who live internationally could not travel home to see their families. I was one of those examples living in, in Asia. And, that, and that's a time when you want to communicate more with people. So when people talk about digital tools, they, they need to remember that the digital tools we have and the underlying tools have made this whole situation easier. And has also actually meant that certain massive parts of the economy can continue to function as well. Now, the flip side, as with everything now, technology, you know, the old idiom that technology can be a force for good and, and a force for bad is, is the whole point about the acceleration as well. You know, there's some parts and some, some sectors of the community which, which call this a digital virus. And the reason they call it a digital virus is because it's, 
accelerated this, this what was already happening, as you said, Julie, this move to digital lives and digital natives to the extreme where older generations now, that silent majority, that silent generation is now being much more accustomed to, to being on Instagram, ordering online. And, and that's not going to change if you think about it. As we come out of this uh, pandemic, hopefully with vaccines in the coming year, a lot of these practices are going to remain. So people are going to get used to being online in that generation. So then you've got digital natives, you've got the middle group, and now you've got the traditional group who never use digital all on the same platforms as well. So that means a whole shift in terms of both economies and new startups and also digital uh, landscape as well. I think the, the key thing, about, again, going to Gary's point about tools, I don't think we can under, under uh, mention that. What's happened, I think the risk we're happening at the moment with the, with the, the sheer expanse of digital technologies is that they're moving from being tools to becoming outcomes. So the digital engagement and the digital platforms themselves become the ultimate aim rather than the fact that it's, it's just enabling human com communication. That's what's getting lost. And then the, the other bit to that, and I see a number of questions on that, Judy, which I think you'll be able to touch on very well towards the end is the human interaction. What do we do? Do the tools get better? Do we have holographic interactions? Or people want to meet again. People want to get off Zoom and meet. So that whole balance is going to start coming back post the pandemic as well. And, and just from our side, from a data center perspective, um, you know, that infrastructure layer, as Gary made the point, um, you know, I see them as frontline workers. You know, the, the operation and the engineering staff around the globe and the construction staff have been going into the sites right at the height of the pandemic, simply to enable the whole digital ecosystem. So without, without those operating facility engineers around the world, without that staff, nobody would communicate with anybody. So that's just to, you know, to reiterate that point as well. That's so true. God bless all of you doing that. It's, you know, it, it's almost hard to fathom what it would have been like if this had happened in 1964 or something like that. And we, it did happen. There was a, a black plague that happened pre-internet, by the way. Uh, you know, so it, 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 there have been sort of plagues rolling through society, but it, you know, that was during an agrarian period where they weren't living in high density cities and people live in, in larger families on farms and they were sort of self-sufficient at that time. So you know, passing through the industrial era, moved to cities and urbanization and, and how our, our world has moved toward a service economy in many places. Again, as you said, this has allowed business continuity and education continuity that wouldn't have been possible prior. And I, I think that that's a, a point that we can't underscore uh, deeply enough here today. Thank you so much, fascinating. Let's, let's get and touch back on some of these themes that are emerging. Buddy. Let's hear from you. You're bright jacket there, looking great. Uh, lo first, love to hear your, your top of mind on this topic. First of all, I have to apologize because Gary told me everyone was wearing their fanciest duds today. And then I show up like this and, and you know, it, it's the way it rocks. Love it. Hey, sequins are always in order in my book. So here's where I'm worried, right? First of all, we could take 15 hours unpacking the 15 minutes of comments you made to start this today. You talked about continuity, but it's not full continuity. Um, I talk a lot about tech versus touch, and I see that every day in my community. I, I don't know if anyone has benefited more financially from COVID than, than Loudoun County. You know, we have, we're adding 6 million square feet of new data center space this year. Uh, our tech companies are, are back to almost 100% employment and moving forward. But if you are part of the touch economy, and that's anything that has to do with personal interaction, people that have to be able to contact and be in contact with other people, those people are suffering. And that gap has widened more during this pandemic than ever before. So there is great continuity for a majority of people, but that minority of people that do not have the means or the infrastructure to fully take advantage of the digital economy is being left behind unlike ever before. And, and you're seeing that even on an education level where you're seeing the acceleration in the tools that are used by some that aren't available to large parts 
of even our county because of the lack of, of you know, ubiquitous broadband. So, you know, I think that that's a real problem and we have to continue to think of what we have here in the digital economy, the digital infrastructure as critical infrastructure. It can no longer be optional to have broadband. We've seen it just completely highlighted like un unlike ever before during this pandemic. It is not optional for people to have broadband. So we have to figure that out. And, and there's not any real solutions. We've looked at it a long time. It's gonna take a long time to figure it out. And, and I do worry about the social aspect of it. Uh, you know, when we all retreat into our, our phones and our digital lives, um, I, I think that that could have long-term social impact on people as, as the, you know, I think we're, it, it, it allows you to easily go into your echo chambers and, and, and it divides people. So I, I think there's a lot of those things that really worry me about this. Uh, certainly, I, I love that we've been able to continue to do business and continue to have these educational sessions and continue to uh, look at ways for us to be entertained. And, and I, I think all that's great, but I, I think as Americans, as world citizens, we have to look at ways to make sure that everyone has the opportunity to benefit from this. Amen to that. <laughs> I think that's really, uh, I think that's a great point. I'm glad you brought that up. And I was going to ask about that uh, later. Um, this pandemic has really brought that into the spotlight, I think. It was always sort of there in the background, but now it's it's cr even more critical. And, and I like how you said that uh, we need to think of this as a critical infrastructure. I I, I, I think that's where, where we're at now. And, and we can talk more about that, but that, that's really a great uh, key point. You guys are amazing. We knew you were amazing uh, to begin. Uh, I'm gonna kick off a question, kick back a question to you uh, to think about, and, then, and we'll get some questions from our audience as well. They've been pouring in now, so that's fantastic. So I'm just gonna ask you guys from the data center perspective to sort of um, respond to some of these trends I talked about uh, in my opening comments. And one of these uh, that I think is really key is the trend of dispersion. One, density is not your friend in a pandemic. We're seeing this going on around the world that people are fleeing the cities in droves, uh, be it New York or San Francisco, this is happening in Paris, this is happening in Barcelona, it's happening all around. Uh, this idea that people are moving out of the cities and the trend has been toward the cities, toward urbanization, and that's where the trend line was pointing. But right now people are flowing out of the cities. And what challenges or will this pose challenges to the data center industry? What, what, what is the impact on, on your industry as a result of dispersion from the cities as opposed to centralization. One of you guys wanna, wanna take that or a couple of you can answer that, but uh, who'd like to jump in on that first? Let, let, let me give it a crack. Yeah, uh, I heard it's always cloudy in Ireland. Is that true? Only Cloud, part, cloud? Only, <laughs> only certain parts of it. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I, I love history, right? I think that we can learn so much from history because human behavior hasn't, biologically hasn't changed that much in the last 500 years, 5,000 years, whatever, maybe the tools. But when I think about when I started in this business, the data business, uh, 85, 86, the first thing that Peter Comerford, my first mentor gave me was a book. And I was a, I was a bad programmer, but he gave me a book called Animal Farm. Four legs good, two legs bad, two legs bad, four legs good. And he said, read it and understand it it's got a parallel of the industry with the uh russian revolution but it's also about human behavior and i said so i did all that and i came back and he said no understand that that's how it works we centralize everything mainframe then we distribute everything local area networks then we centralize everything the cloud then we distribute everything again with the edge so really what we're doing is we're, we're now evolving. 
with fit for purpose technology. And we're at the stage now where we can talk about fit for purpose, work from anywhere. What is it only an acceleration of the centralized distributed, like an accordion. And with, again, not by design, possibly by look, it merges with a technology called 5G, which is just bigger pipes distributed throughout, right? To Buddy's point, however, it's going to give more bandwidth to those that already have it and not much to the poor dude that doesn't even have 1G. But in terms of that harmonica distribution of working from anywhere, some of the infrastructure and tools are in place to allow us to facilitate that. It won't be, as always, in the medium term, the hardware and the software and the bandwidth is not going to be our challenge. Our greatest challenge is privacy and security of the data as distinct to the availability of the center. That's going to be our biggest challenge in 2030 as we look forward to a trillion distributed things on the digital planet, all creating data, well, different speeds, we will then realize why GDPR and things of this nature are so important. It really is just like a, you know, I remember a time, maybe some of the other panelists, when there wasn't safety belts in cars. We used to drive around with one hand on the steering wheel and another one on our gal and sometimes even a beer. Don't say that. Now you can't do those things. You've got side impact bars, you've got exploding steering wheels, you've got self, you know, that's because we've made them safer. So what we need to be looking at going forward isn't the hardware, isn't the connectivity, how safe is the data that goes in the center? And that's really what GDPR and things like that, even in where you are in California, you've adopted a, a version of it. So there's, that's what we should be thinking about is the privacy and security of the data, the hardware this will sort itself out. I love it. I love it. Uh, well, yeah. Do you want to jump in? I do. You know, I'm, I'm not as old as Gary, but I am old, right? So what we have to figure out, I think, is um, what is the long lasting impact going to be on the office space and, and, and the job market. There are going to be those people that are going to work from home now forever or work from wherever forever. Uh, but there are certain jobs where it just doesn't make sense, where you need the collaboration and you need the cooperation. Uh, onboarding new employees in this environment is incredibly hard. You know, you, the, I put a lot of emphasis on culture and I think that's really important. So I think we're going to have to kind of think through where does this really go? Uh, I think what the security front that Gary talked about is so incredibly important. But my sense is it's more important to people of our generation than it is to a younger generation where they don't seem to care if their entire life is public. And, and, and I think that that's, that's an area where they might need to understand how it can impact them at later times. And, and, and I think finally, the other thing that uh, the, the pace at which this, at which this has evolved is, is cause putting great demand on the systems. And that's only going to continue. Now, I was thinking the other day, uh, American football is talking about having a digital only package for, for their games. So they, they won't be on TV. Uh, a, a lot of the games will be just digital. And can you imagine the amount, 30 million people watch an average National Football League game. What is that going to put on, what pressure is that going to put on the data centers and the infrastructure system and, and the, the amount of broadband we have? Uh, and then once your, your refrigerator and your car and, and everything else is also hooked in, the demand on this infrastructure is going to be continuing. And I think that we're going to see the demand outpace supply for easily the next decade and, and probably longer. 
Gosh, there's so much in that to unpack. Uh, <laughs> that was amazing. Uh, and I want to ask, maybe you can um, begin to answer this and we can hear from one of the other panelists as well. Are, are audiences interested in this idea of culture that you mentioned? Uh, and, the, and you just said onboarding new employees. As experienced leaders, what would you say to our audience today regarding how do we create a positive work culture in this moment of being an untethered workforce, untethered management that's emerging? And second of all, can we, and this is me tagging onto this question, can we, can we somehow build in some pillar of wellness into our, our leadership, sort of lead by example, in for our particularly younger workers that are again facing these issues en masse, uh, is there a way to do that? Especially in how important it is in this COVID moment. Would one of you like to talk uh, about that, about workforce issues, leadership, uh, and culture and wellness, um, if you wouldn't mind? Yeah, Omer, you want to take that one? Yeah, happy to take a shot. It's interesting, actually. I'm I'm usually based out of Singapore, but currently in Europe. And uh, we've actually recruited two people during the, the pandemic. So we went through the whole process of recruitment in terms of sourcing, interviewing, onboarding, and I physically have, have not met the person yet. And this is, you know, if you think about previously, this is unheard of, but your point's right. This could become a new norm, right? If you think about it, even post pandemic, if you, if you think about the new generation, they don't see a job as a you know, 10, 20, 30 year corporation career anymore. And they also see it as a bit of a limit on their freedom. They, they wanna travel, they wanna do different jobs. So when they join a role, they may well join a role where they're working for a US firm, but they're basing themselves out of the Philippines. You know, extreme example, but you know, people are gonna travel and work. So they're not necessarily gonna meet people. So what happens, I think is essential, is uh, the technologies, going back to the technologies that we have at hand. So, so Zoom integration, so actually being more engaged in terms of video and telephone generally than face-to-face -face engagement on a daily basis or uh, you know, a few times weekly. And then well-being, I think is a massive point. I think all of us and those probably on this call, this is probably the fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth uh, webinar or Zoom call they've gone on today. You know, if they're in a corporate environment, people are getting Zoomed out. Right, people are getting uh, are getting burnt out as well because what's happening is that the workload is also increasing. As with digital, uh, people are finding that grey line between work and then home time, and then home back to work time is slowly disappearing. You know, even when I speak to people who are taking time off, they're saying, "Well, actually, there's lockdown. I'm probably going to be at home, so I may may as well just work." And what we're trying to say to the teams is, "Don't do that. <laughs> You're on leave." So rather than working, learn something else. Engage with family members in the house. Engage on your favorite topic online. Read stuff, but don't work because then all your all your life becomes from Monday to Friday is a digital work environment constantly, and that's the risk. And I think that's where the digital natives are going to teach us quite a lot because they just won't. I don't think they're going to accept it, and it's going to change that culture. And and I would say. I've been a manager for 35 years, and I think this yeah. is the biggest management challenge that I've ever faced because I have to be more available now than in a typical office environment. I have to be more proactive in reaching out and, and managing the self-care of my people than I've ever had to do before because I can't sense how they're doing. I can't feel the vibe of, of what's going on. So, uh, and, and, and Omer's right, you know, taking time off does not fix your time on if you don't have that, a way to manage that. And so you've got to figure out how to make sure that people aren't, you know, getting up first thing and starting to work and then working till late because they don't have to go anywhere, they don't have to do anything. You know, you've got to make sure that you're setting that expectations for your people that I don't need you and I don't want you working around the clock. You need time to do the things that are important to you and you have to take care of yourself. And, and that has never been more 
important, I think, for us as managers as it is right now in this environment. It's, it's really interesting. Two, two things that you said, buddy. The first thing is, if you're, doing, if, ter, if you're a manager 35 years, I was only 10. So I'm definitely not older than you. That's the first thing. I nice try. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Second thing is my own 18 year old daughter. I have two daughters. My 18 year old daughter uh, asked me, could I bring her to buy a pair of the old fashioned MP3, the old fashioned MP3, right? Why? Because when she brought her phone with the, with the Spotify, et cetera, et cetera, she could hear the bleeps going in on the social media. It was there as a beacon to use the old fashioned mono use mp3 or whatever she put it on her arm she ran and no beeps were coming in isn't that interesting they can teach us so much that to your point julie something that's there when you're born is not technology it's just not you know my own mother god bless her i said you 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 live through the war you live through supersonic you live through what was the greatest invention in your lifetime the ballpoint pen she was a lefty. She was a lefty. Left hand. I'm a you, lefty. Yeah. yeah you, I'm a ever, sinistra. Yeah, lefty. Have you ever <laughs> have you ever written with a uh, ink inkwell? Oh, I no, not an inkwell, but I have written with a a, a fountain pen. A fountain that pen. Has well, wet ink. Yes, it's close. That's the next generation after the. the a, well, I know you grew up with a quill and a and a feather, but I I I have. Listen, a I can get. I, pen. I, I, I don't mind Buddy giving me the shit, but come on, everybody, come on, oh Homer, come on, Homer, it's your turn. I love I'm, that. I'm staying out of this guy. I'm staying. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. Hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna tag on to a couple comments that you made that that were so fascinating, and one of our audience members, our audience member, says that children of today have been surrounded by digital technology since their birth. However, children of today are not equally equipped for their technology-rich future. Various kinds of digital divides still prevail in the society. And following that, uh, linked into that, is this idea that as they grow up in this environment, that they kind of get this on-demand instant gratification. And I talk about that in my book, Don't Care How I Want It Now Mindset. And what I, I'd like to think about here, again, as you guys are experienced leaders in, in the industry, and you're talking about onboarding and employees, and Omar, you talked about how, you know, on to the next, on to the next, and, and, you know, maybe I want to go back, back through Europe and then take a year off. And that's what they're doing. The average time on job now is about 18 months. And I talked to a friend of mine at Warner Brothers in New York. I was talking to him about this, and I, and I said that, and he goes, oh, Julie, we're seeing 10 months, 10 months. My mentor is a CTO of Chevron. He was there for 34 years, you know? So this idea, but how can we, and this is gonna entail, I think some creative out of the box thinking and we're back on culture as well. In this moment of this untethered workforce coming in that's used to, you know, life at the speed of digital, push a button and the Uber shows up, push a button and food arrives at the door, whatever you want, you, even a date, you know, on Tinder and things like that, uh, swiping that? the win. What, what's that? What's that? What's that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, how, what can you do as leaders, business leaders to retain talent in this moment? What culture things, how can we figure that, that maybe all these lateral moves aren't gonna get you somewhere. Cause they also wanna see, by the way, another study showed that young, particularly millennials expect to be promoted in the first year. They, they, they're skyrocketing to the top. Uh, why can't I be senior vice president? And uh, in fact, I had one of my students, by the way, I had the senior VP of Huawei come in and talk in my class. And uh, she, she raised her hand at the end and said, and he, he's probably, full disclosure, maybe 62 years old, somewhere in there. He's around retirement age. And she raised his, her hand and said, well, now I'm applying for jobs. And this is just out of college. Uh, how do I start out at your level? 
this is a college student. How do I start at a senior VP at a major multinational corporation? And he looked like she'd slapped him in the face. You know, she, it was such a shock, like, but she wasn't kidding. And, and he goes, well, you have to have some experience. And another kid raised his hand goes, well, can I get that by reading a book? And they weren't kidding at all. So, so, you know, question is in this on demand, push a button culture, want it now. And as you said, I might want to backpack or go live in the Philippines for a year, or just travel around and have that, that adventure life. How can we retain these workers? How can we get them to stick around a little bit longer? And I think this is going to become a critical question as, as they reach critical mass in workforce. Who, who'd like to take a stab at that idea? I guess I can start. Um, I, I think that, first of all, this is the, the shortest period that I have ever been in a job. And, and I've been here 13 years. Uh, so, I mean, that's, that's a big difference. But to me, it's about purpose. It's about a sense of purpose. And uh, I find that the younger workers, if you can tap into what you're doing and tap into their sense of purpose, and a reason to be, and what that what their impact is, I think that motivates this generation a lot, trying to understand how what I'm doing is important to the world, to my community. Uh, they see that, and I think that does give them more of a reason to stay than money or perks or, or anything else. I think that, and I'm fortunate because my organization does directly impact people's lives. And, and so the people that are around me, uh, I, I think generally understand, especially during this COVID time, that their work is critical to the community. And, and I think that that's one of, the, one of the few tools that we have left in our toolbox to keep people from being as transient as what a lot of the jobs are these days. Yeah. Judy, you know, Buddy is so right. Um, the word purpose, I've only been introduced to it in any meaningful way in the last couple of years of what it means. When we started, when I started, my purpose for getting a job was getting enough money to buy a few pints on a Friday. That was the purpose of, of now it's expanded out into all different. More soci pints. Yeah, socioeconomic uh, and all this type of stuff. But when we, go, when we bring it back to this discussion point, one of the challenges this industry has in attracting and retaining talent is the perception that it does it, it, it's bad for the planet data digitization yeah and it's because of the words that we use a lot of the time it's because it's not communicated to correctly in my opinion that the centers that buddy has 6 million under construction at the moment. Dublin has similar. Singapore has similar. The centers themselves are like the reservoirs holding something. They're there for a reason. They're not just there as a center. They're there to hold data. And that data then is the oxygen that's going out into thermostats, that's going out into smart grids, that's going out into smart devices that basically are tools, getting back to the word, to reduce carbon <laughs> on, tr on unnecessary transport, unnecessary travel. You know, so what we have to do is, and I see some of the questions coming in around sustainability of the digital infrastructure. We got to look at the net figure. We have to reduce the amount that they are using as a footprint, as so renewable energy is brought on grid and stuff. That's a given. And I think they're on year on year, 17% more efficient. But we also then need to see, okay, this Zoom call that we're having here, how much is that costing in terms of carbon versus if we all had gone to San Francisco on a plane, which would have been the equivalent. So we need now to start measuring the sustainability as a net figure as distinct to the gross. And that basically is the purpose. When I, this earlier this year, and, and actually Omer brought up a really great point. He said, when the data and center people were recognized in most locations as essential workers, the chests went out. The people felt, 
wow, I now can actually take the hood off my head when I go out to a public place and say I'm in the data industry because I'm because they were like a utility, a utility provider. And I think that this is a great thing for those people, because if they hadn't have built, designed, operated, again, going back to what we said earlier, we genuinely would be all doing semaphores and uh, phone calls. And this is interesting. But, you know, we tried it before with the dot com bubble where we gave everybody Nokia 6310s and said, knock yourself out. It wasn't much fun and it fell off the cliff. It's because of the tools now that that allow us to have a, a greater sense of purpose exactly to to uh, um, Buddy's point. But this industry should now start to come out and play and talk about the effects that the data that they have in the centers is doing for society. Don't talk about PUEs and all this type of great, wonderful stuff. It's great. It's wonderful. People actually understand the center as Netflix, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I'll, I'll, I'll finish with this one. I, I noticed last week, David Attenborough joined uh, um, Instagram and the headline in the BBC was, David Attenborough joins Instagram to help save the planet. Now, if you don't get the irony in that, you probably don't understand that Instagram is just a brand name for a data center. I love it. I love it. Hey, well, let's uh, let's wrap. Gary, that was beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. And there's so much more we could say here, and I'm sure we will say. Let's hear one minute uh, looking forwards from o Omer and uh, <laughs> much younger Gary <laughs> and Buddy over there. Uh, Omer, let's hear one minute. What should be think we be thinking about on the horizon? Where are we headed? What, what's, what's, what's your one minute, uh, something to be thinking forward toward? I mean, we, I, I've said it in a few talks that I, I give over the past year and pre uh, pandemic even that we are living in one of the most unique times uh, imaginable. Um, I think the, uh, the COVID situation has, has just underlined and made that a definitive. We are living in the most unique times that you could ever live in, I think, uh, close to close to a lot of human history. So, so that brings with it challenges that we've covered, but also I'd say to especially the, the 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 young that it brings huge potential. I mean, you can now start a company with literally just uh, you know a hundred dollars, if not less. You know, you could get a URL, you can get some some computing infrastructure, and if you have a good idea, you can start something. Now you're going to be battling with people from all over the world. So your idea has got to be good, but that's the, that's the potential of today. So I think the opportunities are going to remain. I think uh, the, the, the vaccine is going to be interesting. I think people are ready to meet and travel and, and, and start non-Zooming again. So I think you're going to see a rush to uh, where people are saying traditional uh, conferences and traditional lines of business are dead. I, I don't think that's going to happen. I think people are going to start returning to that. But it's going to be sure. managed. It's going to be, uh, you know, balanced with a with a new digital as well. Um, right. And I think from our infrastructure in Asia, uh, more people coming online, so even more digital. All right, buddy, you got about thirty seconds now because Omer ate about half of your time. But uh, let's hear a last. Where, what, where are we heading in your mind? Equity. Let's make sure that everybody has opportunity to take advantage of this wonderful technology and energy. You know, continue to look at ways that we can evolve in how we use, how we produce, and how we store energy. I love it. Well, speaking of energy, you guys have great energy. Thank you so much for being on this panel. It's been an amazing conversation. And for our audience, thank you for being here and for your participation. And we'll, we'll try to address uh, some of your questions that didn't get answered offline later. So thank you again to Host in Ireland. Thank you to everybody that took part, Omar and Gary and Buddy. And thank you for the Host in Ireland team for getting us all teed up here. And thank Have you a great too. day, everybody.